Part forty four of the Chronicles of Crime, Volume One, by Camden Pelham. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part forty four Edward Lowe and William Jobbins executed for arson. These prisoners were indicted at the Old Bailey Sessions for feloniously setting fire to the house of Francis Gilding in Aldersgate Street on the 16th of May, 1790. From the evidence of the apprentice of Mr. Gilding, who was an accomplice in the wicked deed, it appeared that he was acquainted with the two prisoners, who were persons of bad character, and that it was determined among them that Mr. Gilding's house, which was the Red Lion Inn, should be set on fire, in order that they might plunder it. Accordingly, at about twelve o'clock, on the night of Saturday, 16th of May, they met in the inn-yard, and Lowe got up into the hayloft, and placing some combustibles there, set them alight with a pipe which he was smoking. The fire soon blazed out, and the prisoners were very active in carrying off the goods, which they took away in a cart. The witness was in the act of carrying away a chest of drawers, when he was stopped by Lucy, a constable, upon whose evidence he was convicted. He subsequently, however, on condition of his being pardoned, consented to give evidence against the prisoners. This testimony being confirmed by that of other witnesses, the jury returned a verdict of guilty against the prisoners, and on the 2nd of November they were brought up to receive judgment. The learned recorder then addressed them in the following terms. I hardly know how to find words to express the abhorrence that I feel, or that the public entertains, of the crime of which you stand convicted. The setting fire to houses in the dead of night, for the purpose of plunder, at the risk of the lives of the inhabitants of a great city, is a crime not yet to be met with upon the records of villainy that have been brought forward in this court. As the crime is singular, so the punishment must be marked. I take it it will be so marked, and hope the example will be such, that if there should be left any persons of the same wicked intentions, they will take example from your fate. As your crime is singular and novel, I hope it will be the only one brought into this court of the same description. You therefore must prepare to die, and consider yourselves as men without hope in this world, and give me leave to assure you that it is my decided opinion that for an offence so very atrocious as yours you can never expect salvation in the world to come, unless you will make some reparation to your injured country and to God, whom you have offended by a sincere confession of all the offences of which you have been guilty, and by a disclosure of the names of all persons who either have engaged or are about to engage in crimes so detestable as that of which you stand convicted. Nothing therefore remains but that I should pray to Almighty God, and it is now my earnest prayer to Him, that you may all obtain forgiveness and remission of your sins. On the morning of 20th of November these incendiaries were brought out of Newgate, and placed on a high seat, which had been fixed in the cart to render them more conspicuous to the spectators. They were then conveyed, attended by the sheriffs and other city officers, to Aldersgate Street, where a temporary gallows was erected opposite the spot where stood the house of Mr. Gilding, to which they had set fire. They arrived at the fatal tree about quarter before nine o'clock, when Mr. Villette, the ordinary, went into the cart and prayed with them for about twenty minutes, after which they were turned off. They both confessed to Mr. Villette the facts for which they had so justly suffered. Jobbins had been educated at St. Paul's School, was bred a surgeon, and was only nineteen years of age when he suffered. Lowe was about twenty-three years of age. A boy named Mead was on the 31st of August in the ensuing year executed for a similar offence in firing a house of his master, Mr. Walter Cavardine, a publican in Red Lion Street. Joseph Wood and Thomas Underwood executed for robbery. The whole parties in this case may be literally called children, the malefactors being but fourteen years of age each, and the prosecutor no more than twelve. Though of this tender age, yet they were convicted as old and daring depredators. So often had they already been arraigned at that bar, where they were condemned, that the judge declared, notwithstanding their appearance, they were short, dirty, ill-visaged boys, it was necessary for the public safety, 
to cut them off, in order that other boys might learn that, inured to wickedness, their tender age would not save them from an ignominious fate. The crime for which they suffered was committed with every circumstance of barbarity. They forcibly took away a bundle containing a jacket, shirt, and waistcoat from a little boy, and then fell upon him, and would probably have murdered him, had they not been secured. They had long belonged to a most desperate gang of pickpockets and footpads, but so hardened and obstinate were they, that they would not impeach their companions, though the hopes of mercy were held out to them on making a confession, so that the villains might have been apprehended. They were executed at Newgate, July 6th, 1791, apparently insensible of their dreadful situation. William Gadsby, executed for robbery. In recording the case of this culprit, a Scotch newspaper says, he was one of the most notorious villains that has figured in the line of roguery in this country for many years, and though only twenty-eight years of age, his criminal exploits appear, both in variety and number, to equal, if not to exceed, the achievements of the most dexterous and grey-headed offender. As this fellow lived, so he determined to die with notoriety. He was brought to the gallows at Edinburgh, February the 20th, 1791, dressed in a suit of white cloth trimmed with black. The awful ceremony, the dreadful apparatus of death, the surrounding multitude of spectators, appeared not to shake his frame, nor to agitate his mind. He mounted the platform of death with a firm step, and stood with great composure till the apparatus was adjusted, and then, in a collected manner, and in an audible voice, gave a brief account of his life. He said that the first robbery he committed was in a stationer's shop, where he purloined a pocket-book. The success of this childish theft encouraged him to commit others, and in a short time he gave himself wholly up to thieving, never letting an opportunity slip of possessing himself of money or goods, by fraud or force, until the day he was committed to jail. He said that he often escaped in hackney chairs, and advised the officer on guard at the castle to search all such vehicles. He declared most solemnly that three miserable men, who had been executed two years before at the place where he then stood, of the names of Falconer, Bruce, and Dick, were innocent, for that he himself had committed the robberies for which they were condemned. With exultation he continued to say that the sums he had acquired by thieving and cheating did not amount to less than two thousand pounds, besides the fortune of an unhappy woman whom he seduced and ruined. It was high time to stop the monster's speech, and the platform was therefore dropped, while yet he was exulting in his sins. Scotland, says the paper from which we extract this unparalleled case, seems to be in an improving state. The following ingenious contrivance was lately practised at Glasgow. While a merchant in King Street was counting some money and banknotes on a counter, a staff or small rod, overlaid with bird-lime, was suddenly thrust in at the door, which, having touched the notes, two of them were thereby carried off, and, before the merchant could pursue, the ingenious actor had made his escape. THE BIRMINGHAM RIOTS These riots were of a nature very similar to those which broke out in London in the year 1780. The outbreak appears to have been occasioned by no immediate cause, but rather by a general feeling of discontent which pervaded the minds of the people in this great manufacturing town, aided by the celebration of the anniversary of the French Revolution, and a seditious handbill which had been previously circulated. The riot was commenced by an attack being made upon a tavern in Temple Lane, in which eighty or ninety persons had sat down to a dinner provided on Thursday 14th of July 1791, in order to celebrate the event referred to when, notwithstanding the personal interference of the magistrates, the windows in front of the house were demolished, and many of the company were assaulted. The popular anger being thus excited, the mob proceeded to destroy Dr. Priestley's meeting-house, and the old meeting-house, the first of which they set on fire, while they contented themselves with burning the furniture of the latter in the burial-ground. Dr. Priestley's house, at Fair Hill, together with his valuable collection of apparatus for philosophical experiments, was also destroyed, and the mob then dispersed for the night. 
On the next morning, however, they again assembled, and, being unopposed by any civil or military force, they proceeded to the commission of new outrages. Many were armed with bludgeons and weapons of offence, and, shouting, Church and King, they attacked the houses of all who were obnoxious to them, or opposed to the principles which they professed. The mansion of Mr. John Ryland, at Easy Hill, was the first object to which they directed their fury. But many of them, having got into the cellars, got so drunk with the wine which they found there, as to be unable to effect their escape, while their associates, without, unmindful of their safety, set fire to the house, and they were buried beneath its ruins. Bordsley Hall, the residence of John Taylor, Esquire, shared a similar fate, the mob refusing to listen to any proposition to induce them to retire. And on the same night the house of Mr. Hutton in the town was completely stripped. A number of special constables were in the meantime sworn in, and attacked the mob with some determination, but being far inferior in numbers and quite undisciplined, they were compelled to retire. Saturday only dawned to exhibit fresh ravages. Mr. Hutton's house at Washwood Heath, three miles from the town, Mr. Humphrey's mansion at Sparkbrook, Mr. W. Russell's house at Shewell Green, Mr. T. Hawkes's house at Moseley Wake Green, and Moseley Hall, the seat of the Dowager Countess of Carhampton, were in turn attacked, and were all in flames at the same time. Business was brought to a stand, and no military force arriving, the mob continued their acts of lawless atrocity undisturbed. At night many of them levied contributions from the inhabitants of the town of meat and money, and on the following day they pursued the same course in the outskirts in reference to all persons they met. The Sabbath even did not restrain them in their diabolical proceedings, for on that day they burned two dissenting meeting-houses, and the minister's dwellings, situated at about six miles from Birmingham. At night, soon after ten o'clock, three troops of the fifteenth light dragoons arrived amid the acclamations of the inhabitants whose hopes and fears had been depicted through the day in every countenance, as reports of the near approach of the soldiery were spread and contradicted. The town was immediately illuminated, and before morning everything was tolerably quiet. But the rioters were still continuing their depredations in the country. They exhausted the cellars at each place, and received various sums of money to prevent their proceeding to further violence. They were in great force at the time the troops arrived, of which they no sooner had intimation than they began to slink off in small parties, and the peasantry, taking courage, put the rest to flight in various directions. On Monday the town appeared in perfect security, but as much crowded as during the three preceding days in viewing the military the mob keeping at such distance as to render all accounts of them dubious, at one time being said to be at Alcester, the next hour at Bromsgrove, etc. On Tuesday there were flying rumours of depredations near Hagley, Hales Owen, etc., and in the evening certain information was received that a party of rioters were then attacking Mr. Males of Bellevue. A few of the light dragoons immediately went to his assistance, but the rioters had been previously overpowered by a body of people in that neighbourhood, and ten of them were confined at Hales Owen. On Wednesday morning the country round for ten miles was scoured by the light horse, but not one rioter was to be met with, and all the manufactories were at work, as if no interruption had taken place. Three troops of the eleventh light dragoons marched in this morning, and more soldiers soon after, making their appearance, the whole neighbourhood was soon restored to tranquillity. At the ensuing assizes held at Warwick on the 22nd of August, a great number of the persons concerned in these outrages were put upon their trial before Mr. Baron Perrin. They were indicted under the Black Act, and although in several cases the jury appear to have acted in a manner somewhat extraordinary in declaring the prisoners not guilty, many were convicted and received sentence of death. Two of them, however, were pardoned, but the remainder expiated their offences on the scaffold. THE MUTINY OF THE BOUNTY The case of the mutineers of the bounty has always attracted considerable attention. The bounty was an armed vessel, commanded by Captain Bly, which quitted England in the autumn of 1789 for the purpose of making discoveries and of trading among the southern islands, and having visited the friendly and the Otaheitan Islands in the South Pacific Ocean, in the month of May 1790, 
she set sail on her way back to England. On the 27th of that month they lost sight of land, and up to that time there had been nothing in the conduct of the crew or petty officers which could induce a supposition that any disorder was likely to take place. The mid-watch was duly relieved, but at daybreak on the following morning the cabin of the captain was forcibly entered by the officer of the watch, Fletcher Christian, who held the rank of master's mate, and who had previously been considered a good and faithful seaman, aided by three others, who dragged their commander on deck, threatening instant death if he dared to speak. The captain exerted all his eloquence to bring back the mutineers to their duty, but his exertions were of no avail, and he soon afterwards found the peaceful part of the crew and the officers brought upon deck and pinioned. The mutineers told them that they need hope for no escape by employing violence, for that all the muskets were charged, and they corroborated their assertions by exhibiting an armed body of their own number with muskets and fixed bayonets. The captain at once perceived that he was in the power of his men, and his doubts as to his fate were speedily put to an end by his seeing the long boat lowered over the side, which he and his fellows, to the number of eighteen, were commanded to enter no other nourishment being afforded them but about one hundred and forty pounds of bread, thirty pounds of meat, a gallon and a half of rum, an equal quantity of wine, and a few gallons of water. A compass and a quadrant were seized by the captain as his unfortunate companions were entering the boat, and as soon as he had taken his place the mutineers gave three cheers and stood away, as they said, for Otter Haiti. Captain Bly, on taking muster of the remains of his crew left to him, found that he had in his boat the boatswain, the carpenter, the gunner, the surgeon's mate, two midshipmen, and one master's mate, with Mr. Nelson, the botanist, and a few inferior officers. After a short consultation, it was deemed expedient to put back to the friendly islands, and having reached the coast of one of them, they landed, in hopes of improving their stock of provisions. For several days they continued unmolested, but at length, on the 30th of April, they were attacked by the natives, with such violence that one man was killed, and several wounded. They were therefore compelled immediately to shear off, and it became now the subject of inquiry and deliberation as to what should be their next place of destination. Otaheite was proposed, as it was supposed that the natives would be friendly to them, but the apprehension of falling in with the bounty determined them against this course and, with one assent, they made up their minds to shape their course for Timor, a settlement belonging to the Dutch. To effect this enterprise they were compelled to calculate the distance with a view to the apportionment of their provisions, and having discovered that it was near four thousand miles, they agreed that their rations should not exceed an ounce of bread and a gill of water a day for each man. Upon this scanty allowance they subsisted without any other nourishment until the 6th of June, when they made the coast of New Holland and collected a few shellfish, and with this small relief they held on their way to Timor, which they reached on the twelfth, after being forty-six days in a crazy open boat, so confined in its dimensions as to prevent any of them lying down for repose, and without the least awning to protect them from the rain, which fell almost incessantly for forty days, a heavy sea and squally weather augmenting their misery during a considerable part of the time. On their reaching Timor they received every assistance from the governor, and having remained until the 20th of August to recruit their strength, they procured a vessel in which they took their passage to Batavia. They reached that port on the 2nd of October, and from thence they immediately embarked for the Cape of Good Hope. Captain Bly quitted the Cape in the month of December, and having reached England, he communicated the particulars of the mutiny to the Admiralty, and HMS the Pandora was immediately dispatched in search of the mutineers. It was not until the 25th of April, 1792, that dispatches were received from Captain Edwards, stating that on the Pandora appearing off Otaheite, two men swam from the shore, and solicited to be taken on board. They proved to be two of the Bounty's mutineers, and gave intelligence where fourteen of their companions were concealed on the island. A part of the Pandora's crew were sent in search of them, and after some resistance, they were taken and brought prisoners on board. It then turned out that Christian had taken upon himself the command of the bounty immediately on the captain's having quitted her, and that his crew consisted of twenty-five men. When the Pandora arrived, Christian, with the other nine mutineers, 
had previously sailed in the bounty to some remote island, and every exertion to discover their retreat proved ineffectual. On her return home, the Pandora struck upon a reef of rocks in the Endeavour Straits. Her crew escaped from their perilous situation to an island in the Straits, except thirty-three men and three of the Bounty's people, who perished by the boat oversetting. Captain Edwards was reduced to the necessity of sending one of his officers and some seamen in a small boat to Timor, which they were fourteen days in reaching, and where a vessel was procured, which proceeded to the assistance of the remainder of the crew. So much had the mutineers of the bounty conformed to the custom and manners of Otaheite, that when two men of Christian's crew swam off to the Pandora, they were so tattooed, and exhibited so many other characteristic stains, that on being first received on board, the Pandora's people took them for natives of the island. The names of the above metamorphosed mutineers were Peter Haywood, a midshipman, and Joseph Coleman, the armourer, the latter of whom, Captain Bly observes, was detained by Christian, contrary to his inclination. On the 12th of September, a court-martial commenced on board the Duke, in Portsmouth Harbour, on Joseph Coleman, Charles Norman, Thomas Mackintosh, Peter Haywood, Isaac Morris, John Millward, William Muspratt, Thomas Burkett, Thomas Ellison, and Michael Byrne. The evidence for the prosecution closed on Friday night, the 14th, and the court indulged the prisoners till Monday to give in their defence, and on Tuesday took the whole into their consideration, when they were pleased to pass sentence of death on Haywood, Morris, Millward, Muspratt, Burkett, Ellison, the two first of whom the court recommended to mercy. Coleman, Norman, Mackintosh, and Byrne were acquitted and discharged. On the 29th of October, Millward, Burkett, and Ellison were executed on board the Brunswick. Hayward and Morris were pardoned in compliance with the recommendation of the court. End of part 44